Good morning. Good morning and welcome to this session. I want to share with you today some of the work that we have done on implementing deep learning pipelines for a high energy physics use case. My name is Luca Canali. I'm a data engineer at CERN with the Hadoop Spark service and database service. I've been doing data engineering for a few years and I enjoy learning and sharing experience with the community. Here are some of the links where you can find some of the work that I've done. I work at CERN. CERN runs the world's largest uh, particle accelerator and is also home to four uh, large high energy physics experiments. They take advantage of the accelerator, the LHC. The experiments, you can see here some of the pictures, are large and are run by large collaborations of scientists with the ultimate goal of finding uh, new, the laws of nature furthering the knowledge of high energy physics. I will give you a brief introduction, a basic introduction of the use case that we want to solve with the technology that will be the, the core of this talk. So the first thing is that high energy physics, the experimental part at least of it, is a data intensive domain. So what you do, you collide particles that come uh, from the accelerator, you collide them and you collect the debris of these collisions, then you reconstruct is debris and from that you, um, you do analysis and you find uh, new insights into high energy physics. And this is a statistical uh, type of uh, discovery that you do. So what you need is to uh, collect a large amount of data and use computing to uh, compute on those data and finally you end up typically with uh, histograms and building up um, some, some graphs that that uh, tell you something new about the physics. So, for example, um, a graph of the early uh, say data for the Higgs boson discovery. So there is a challenge, a big challenge, actually there are many in energy physics, but one, there is a big one already at data collection. What happens is that proton-proton collision at LHC happen every 25 nanoseconds. So, and a lot of data is coming through uh, the system and needs to be collected. It's actually not really possible to store all the data that are uh, being, say, generated by the detectors, by the experiments, because that would be too much data and it would be too much compute to process this data. And actually most of it is not so interesting because we are, we are looking at rare events typically, not the, uh, the typical uh, background or the, uh, say, boring events, something you know already about. So what happens these days is that uh, at the uh, particle uh, beams collisions, you typically have five collisions for at each time you, you cross the beams. What will happen in a few years is that um, a, a new project will upgrade the LHC to what is called high luminosity LHC, where to, uh, with the aim of collecting more statistics, uh, there will be more collisions every time the beams cross. So uh, in terms of the complexity, I mean, these graphics, what is now today on the left and what will be on the, uh, in, the, in 2026 with the LH, uh, luminosity LHC already shows you how complex this will be. So a big challenge. So we, what happens is that we have uh, indeed 40 million collisions per second, at least beam crossing per second, and then we kind of store that. So we, we start throwing away data. So the uh, all the online teams of the various experiments have devised systems that they call triggers and um, that they work in chain. Typically, you have uh, two or three chains where you start throwing away events that you, you figure out that are not so interesting. And the aim is that you have to fit the amount of data that you store in what is possible, both to, uh, in terms of bandwidth for storing and also down the road on bandwidth to actually compute on those events. So you go from basically a petabyte per second to 10 gigabytes per second. And this is a big part of what happens in the online, at least on the uh, software side. So um, physicists are working on online systems are always trying to improve the quality of their filtering systems. So the use case where we attach uh, the, the technology that we'll describe uh, in a few minutes is an R&D on uh, improving this filtering using uh, neural networks. So improve the quality of the filtering, reduce the number of uh, 
false positive. A false positive is costly because you have to store it and you will have to compute it afterwards. And then you throw it away uh, when you do analysis because you figure out actually you didn't want to have that event. So deep learning has been used in high energy physics since many, many years. And uh, these days people are, uh, are increasing the usage and research on top of it. So we built uh, the pipeline on, uh, on top of um, a research article that uh, is, is linked here, where a particle classifier has been built. This particle classifier divides the, the particle stream in, uh, into three different categories. You don't need, really need to know what they mean. They could actually be yellow, blue, and red. It's actually W plus jet, QCD, and TT bar. Some of those are more interesting. For example, TT bar uh, typically is something you want to um, observe because th this is typically a signal of uh, good physics, but also more, actually more complicated than that. So uh, um, a classifier is something that maybe many of you that also don't work in energy physics but uh, do something uh, with machine learning are already familiar. So we bring a physics problem into a data, uh, data problem. So we do data ingestion for the pipeline then we'll do feature preparation. Then we want to do model development. And we want to do training. Okay, so now we, this is a common, uh, say, machine learning and data analysis pipeline. And for this um, exercise, we wanted to use the Spark technology, so build the pipeline using tools that are common uh, for these open source uh, environments as opposed to using tools that have been developed, for example, specifically for physics or handcrafted, for example, Python scripts and, uh, and, and glued various parts of the pipeline, as for example was the case of the original uh, work. So this is also because we wanted to link what we have at CERN. Since a few years, we have developed an analytics platform that uh, brings together software and uh, systems that are pre-existing at CERN so CERN has been uh, handling these very large data sets on the orders of hundreds of petabytes since many years. So even before Hadoop and Spark and other big data technology existed. So now that, that we have Spark and other technologies that are built on top, we want to integrate the two and offer the possibility to our users to use an analytics platform and link the two systems. So we link the software, for example, energy physics software, then uh, storage systems where uh, the physics data is stored. For example, we have a system called EOS, which is, has many similarities, for example, with S3 storage, but it's different. And then we have, of course, Hadoop clusters. And then we have, um, in terms of Hadoop clusters, it's stor both storage and compute. And recently also we, uh, we have uh, Kubernetes on uh, OpenStack, so cloud type um, of resources uh, that are deployed internally at CERN. And in terms of front end, this is, this is familiar to many of you. That there will be a Jupyter notebook where people can, uh, can work, for example, in Python, can use the Spark APIs, and also all other Python tools that are, um, that are used by the different communities at CERN and then uh, put together code and, uh, and visualization. This is pretty standard these days. In terms of computing infrastructure, so we use the clusters that we have in Hadoop and Cloud. This, these are not the computing resources used to process the hundreds of petabytes of physics data, but it's a separate cluster, of course, it's on smaller size. Here we are talking about uh, 2,000 cores on Hadoop. And, okay, cloud is scalable. At the moment, we have a small setup, but of course, it's, uh, it's elastic, can be increased anytime. To put together the two words, another uh, important point that we have to do was to uh, link the Spark word, word uh, and uh, do board together with uh, the existing physics storage. So there are two, um, say, proprietary, uh, let's say, uh, at least typical of CERN and high energy physics uh, domains is that the storage system that we use EOS, which speaks a particular protocol, which is a do called uh, XRUD. So we built a connector that allows to read uh, XRUD uh, data. And also, um, typical data in physics is written with, in a root format, which is a columnar format. Let's say similar to Parquet, but it's not Parquet. So for that, we also built um, a data source in Spark to do that. And this allows to read the physics data. As I mentioned, there are already at least 300 petabytes of um, data already stored. And this is increasing at a high rate, which is actually accelerating. 
Okay, now we have all the ingredients. So we have the technology to make Spark talk with the existing physics infrastructure. We have the use case that I briefly described. At the moment, it's just about uh, deploying uh, this data pipeline and deep learning pipeline using uh, this high energy, um, it is, it is open source tools. So all the pipelines start with data. Data we, uh, we received from uh, the research team that developed the original article and is, um, is built using simulation. Simulation is highly used in high energy physics to do all sorts of analysis. Uh, so this data simulates collisions of, of about 40, 54 million events. The data is stored in a root format, as uh, typically uh, physicists will do these days. And we, we took that data and we started processing the pipeline. The first step is data ingestion. So we uh, received 4.5 terabyte of data. So we read it from the uh, storage system. And we apply, uh, we use uh, PySpark code on Jupyter Notebooks. And we apply a uh, certain type of filters. And we'll see uh, later on more details. And uh, we do event filtering and we generate the features. Actually, there are two sets of features. One is high level, uh, low level features, which uh, I will describe later. And another one is high level features that also for another classifier. At the end, the filtering produces 25 million events from the 54 that we had. And we have about a terabyte of data and we write it on HDFS. And also in, a, in more recent tests, we've also been uh, using cloud resources. So we've been, we've been writing it into S3 compatible storage. So the feature engineering does filtering. Uh, for example, one thing is that we want to have events where, uh, where we have at least one electron or a muon. This is a type of particle. And they have, they have to have a certain uh, say, um, transverse momentum, which is a property of the, of the particles, for example, a certain uh, uh, value. And then the, uh, when the filter is true, so with the, for the old events that we take, we create the low-level uh, features in form of a matrix. This is a matrix of 801 particles with 19 low-level features that have some physical significance. So th this creates quite a large amount of data when you multiply for, by the 25 million events that we have. And then there is also another processing that creates uh, a simpler data set, which is uh, called high-level features, which, which instead of having a matrix, you only have 14 uh, computed features. The features are computed according to some uh, physics knowledge. And then we have a second step, again, in preparing the data. This is a more standard, uh, say, uh, data processing to prepare it before doing the actual machine learning part. So for example, on not encoding on categories, mean max scaling. Then for the uh, low level features that are in the matrix, we want to sort that matrix because it will be uh, useful later for a GRU model that I will describe and undersampling as well, uh, to, um, we have three categories in the classifier, we want to have the same number of events for each category to make uh, better results in the training. So we end up with 3.6 million events, about 300 gigabytes of data. So we started with 4.5 terabytes. Then we shuffle the data, split in training and test data sets, all standard things. And we use Jupyter Notebooks there again to uh, do the processing. I'll have a link at the end, all the code is available on GitHub. So you can, you can also browse if you want to see a little bit how it's implemented. So a, a first uh, checkpoint on some uh, lessons learned, for example, on performance on this. So one uh, first thing that we saw is that data, this data preparation is CPU bound. Even though we read uh, 4.5 terabyte, actually we need to spend a lot of CPU to do that because of the uh, heavy Python UDF that we have. And in particular, using Python UDF, we end up spending a lot of time CPU, in CPU and doing serialization and deserialization. This is a known, let's say, problem in uh, using uh, Python uh, with Spark. Um, okay, but we use um, Hadoop cluster. So when we do, of course, there is a lot of time that goes in preparing uh, this, this data, pre uh, these data preparation steps. And this, this takes much more than the actual execution at the end. Uh, at the end, we could. We could afford 400 cores, which is a percentage of the capacity of the cluster, and it, it ran for three hours. Actually, it was definitely acceptable, uh, but also as an exercise, we wanted to see if we could optimize it. In terms of uh, probably the economics of it, is, I'm not sure it was uh, too much needed because it takes more time to optimize it than actually run it. Uh, 
But there was one optimization we wanted to show, be also because we use this as a demonstrator of what can be done in the future, is the, the idea of using more Spark SQL instead of Python uh, UDL. Uh, we know that Spark uh, basically SQL or data frame processing in general works internally in Spark, so it runs faster than serializing and deserializing. Uh, one very cool thing that we that it's in Spark since 2.40, at least in Apache Spark, is higher order functions with Spark SQL that allows to process um, arrays of data. This, this data that we have, this data sets as a lot of uh, arrays, so, so it makes sense, for example, when we want to say, we want to have an electron or a muon with, uh, with this filter of uh, 23 uh, giga electron volt for the uh, transverse momentum, we just use the uh, this higher order function, as in the slide here, to filter out all the electrons with this uh, condition inside the array. And then the filter at, at the outer part of the query becomes like, give me only the events where uh, basically this filter has selected at least one event. And just, just changing a few of these uh, things around in the code, we brought the execution time down from three hours to two hours, but also it was very nice to to show the, um, the idea of using more SQL to do this computation. So Spark is not only parallelizing uh, the execution of UDF, but it's also being used for their uh, SQL functions. Okay, so now we have the data, and so we, we, uh, we go more into um, the actual, uh, say, neural networks and uh, model development. So there again, from the research paper, we got uh, three different type of models. One is quite simple, is a feed-forward uh, network. Uh, which uses the high level feature, which are only 14 per event. So at the end, it's only one gigabyte of data, so it's quite a simple problem. Uh, the second model uh, uses uh, current networks, so a GRU in particular, but could also be an LSTM. And it takes 300 gigabytes because it feeds on the uh, arrays of particles with the low level features. And actually, there's another model, which is the best one of the three, that combines the, uh, the two models, the one, one and two. That we call it the inclusive classifier. Also, in terms of the exercise, we also experimented with hyperparameter tuning. Uh, for this, we use Spark basically just to parallelize uh, jobs running uh, KRS model on a subset of the data. So, uh, for example, you, you try different, uh, different sizes of the uh, networks for the uh, feedforward classifier and you figure out uh, which size is better. And for this, we, um, as you see in this slide, we pipe together scikit-learn and KRS and, and use Spark. But this was more an exercise because actually the, uh, the model development we already got from the original research paper. But it's nice to know that uh, Spark can actually be used for hyperparameter tuning. Probably several of you are already using it in that way. Okay, and uh, for the GRU model, we needed to uh, scale out uh, the deep learning because, it, as I said, it's about 300 gigabytes of data. The model is relatively complex using a GRU. So it, it wouldn't run, for example, on a, on a desktop machine on CPUs uh, very well. And uh, so we, we looked a little bit what was available in the environment in terms of uh, scaling out uh, uh, deep learning with Spark. So and some of the constraints that we had, because the, the space is quite big, and so we had to make a choice. So we, we uh, took in consideration our um, constraints. So one thing is that our neural network model was written in a Keras API. So we find these days that uh, uh, scientists at CERN typically use Keras or uh, PyTorch. And uh, we wanted to deploy on, a, on our Hadoop clusters or, and uh, Kubernetes clusters uh, using Spark typically. And we wanted to do distributed uh, deep learning because of the GRU model. So for this, uh, we turned into um, using Analytics Zoo and BigDL also because of some collaboration with Intel that we have undergoing with a certain uh, open lab effort. And uh, we've already seen uh, how Apache Spark can uh, process very well the data. And BigDL is an open source distributed deep learning framework that sits on, a, on top of Apache Spark in a quite a natural way. Analytics Zoo builds on top of it and makes it even easier to use. You can use Data Frame API as opposed to RDD and you have all sorts of uh, nice additions on top that makes it more usable. Uh, for the rest of this presentation, I would say we're using Analytics Zoo plus BigDL, so uh, we use them interchangeably. So but the actual engine for the, the, um, the distributed deep learning is BigDL, which is an open source project, but I understand mostly developed uh, by Intel. And 
it runs as a, so the deep learning training runs as a Spark job, and it takes uh, the, uh, the Spark infrastructure with driver and workers to parallelize out uh, the uh, deep learning, um, say, a job. And also being written by, mostly by Intel, it has very nice optimizations of using MKL that makes better use of CPUs when, uh, when doing a neural network training. Uh, some of the key components behind it, uh, Big DL that makes this work is the uh, Big DL uh, uses parameter synchronization, it's a synchronous training. It, uh, so uh, parameter server distributed in the block manager of uh, the Spark executors allows to scale out the training and then Spark uh, jobs and tasks will calculate gradients and, and weights and feedback the updates into the uh, parameter server. You can get more information on the, uh, this link. So okay, we have a tool and uh, we have a model, we have data, so let's put all the things together. So the first thing is the, um, the simple model with high level features, so 14 features per event and a simple uh, deep neural network with just dense, uh, three dense uh, layers stacked one on top of the other. And uh, as you can see, the um, one nice thing of using uh, Big DL and Analytics Zoo is that basically we can use the uh, Keras API. If you use Keras, you will recognize the syntax on how the model is described just by a sequence of layers. In this case, uh, uh, basically three layers plus a final, uh, three layers that, that defined in the network. And then you point it to the data that you can read with Spark data frames, and, uh, and there you go. Uh, a more complex model is the, uh, what we call the inclusive classifier that takes a GRU part. Uh, this is a recurrent model that takes the, uh, the matrices of 801 particles with 19 features each on the left. And on the right is the high-level feature, so the 14 uh, features per, uh, per event. Then these two models are uh, combined after some dropout and concatenated, and at the end we have a softmax layer, soft layer, and uh, with three three outputs, uh, which correspond to three difficult, three different categories of uh, particles that we want to classify. There again, uh, the syntax of how we describe the model using Analytics Zoo and Big DL is basically uh, Keras. It just comes straight uh, straight from the Keras model that was developed uh, originally. And then uh, the distributed training, I, I here I have some uh, uh, snippet of code. For example, for the uh, high level feature classifier, you can see we just used the neural network estimator of um, Analytics Zoo, where we feed the data and, uh, and the labels, and then it will do the uh, training with the usual syntax of uh, fitting into the estimator. And here on the right, you can see um, two curves of the loss as a function of the number of iterations for the uh, high level feature classifier and for the inclusive classifier, which is the, the best one, the best model that we have. In terms of uh, the complexity of the training, they are kind of different because the high level classifier has only one gigabyte of data and the inclusive classifier is more than 300 gigabytes of data and a much more complex model. Okay, something on how uh, this has worked out, uh, especially scalability is an important point here because uh, we, we are training, so that was the original reason of using these tools, this was to scale out the training to reduce the amount of time that is needed. And uh, so for example, here on the right, uh, it's how we scaled out the, um, the uh, DNN model with high level features. It actually scales out almost linearly. Uh, and on the left, for the inclusive classifier, where we actually scaled out on cloud resources on OCI, uh, for example, we show there from between 100 and 200 cores, it scales out almost linearly. This is what you want, so you just, if you want to have it run faster, you just put more resources to it, which is uh, exactly what you want typically. In terms also of, re, let's say, the performance, of how, so how the final model performs, we also looked at that. Uh, standard measure, for example, is plotting the rock curve and calculating the IUC. So we compare this also with the original paper. And uh, you see the three models, so the high-level classifier works quite well, but the inclusive classifier works even better. And uh, we get basically the same results as uh, the first uh, research paper. So everything uh, works well also in terms of how the uh, model performance is after the development of the model. In terms of workload, 
we find uh, that uh, training with analytics zoo is CPU bound. Uh, this is for the GRU uh, model. So the, in the first phase, actually the, uh, the system loads up the data into memory and then it starts executing and uh, it's mostly CPU bound here. Also, also probably why it scales well because typically a CPU bound workload have a better scalability. Okay, so and, uh, recently we've also uh, been quite excited by all the development in TensorFlow 2.0, so we started also looking at that. And I wanted to report also on our experience, also compared to, to what we've seen so far. Uh, so we took the data. The, the first thing that happens is that with Big DL and Analysis Zoo, uh, you read the data in Spark data frame. So we have the data in Parquet, and then you feed it uh, to this training uh, system. And the data is basically uh, is, is smooth. It will just read your data frame data. While with TensorFlow, uh, you will have typically to use um, a different data format. So we figured out that TF record is a recommended format. But then again, Spark can be used to convert Parquet data into TF record. The uh, TensorFlow library has, um, has a data source to do that. But there is not so smooth also the usage because you, have, you will have to figure out a TensorFlow data pipeline to read the data back. This is going on with TF data and TF IO. So there again, an additional effort compared to that. Another nice thing of TensorFlow 2 is that they simplify the way of distributing uh, compute, um, training uh, with TF distribute. Now it's very simple uh, to distribute uh, Keras models. Uh, but then you have to figure out how to parallelize it. It doesn't work out of the box with Spark, so you have to uh, do something on top of it. Probably Qflow would be a, a, say a more mainstream solution, but we figured out that it's so simple that we wrote basically a script, and it's also there in GitHub that uh, you can run on Kubernetes resources. And these are some of the results that we have. Uh, there again, we see that the more cores that we put, the, uh, the faster the training. But also, I think it's true of many distributed training uh, models is that uh, the loss that you get for the certain amount of, uh, say, epochs takes a bit of a hit uh, when you do distributed training. Okay, in terms of performance, which is, it's key in, the, in this business. What some of the things that we learned are the following. So we measuring the distribution time, it went, uh, the, the training time, it went from a few hours to say 11 hours. And this depends on many parameters, so how many epochs you want to train for, uh, what's your batch size as well. That makes a quite a difference. And it's hard to compare the different models and solutions and the systems used because of the many parameters. So maybe let's not go, uh, get there. But say a couple of things of the two methods tried. So with distributed training with Big DL and AT Zoo integrates very well with Spark. Very, very straightforward. It also the API follows basically the, 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 the Spark um, API, so it comes natural. One thing that we figured out that it needs to cache data in memory, so you need to have enough memory for that. And we found sometimes a few problems with our cluster, at least the loop cluster that has a bit of noise and stragglers at the moment, uh, the parameter synchronization on Analytics Zoo was suffering. For example, in a cloud environment where it was uh, more quiet, uh, in that respect, we, we found better results in scalability. Uh, with TensorFlow 2.0, we didn't play much with it, but okay, what we've done is seen that it's straightforward to use because of the improvements in uh, TF distribute, but it is not as seamless as a pipeline if you do the data preparation with Spark. So basically, you have to do something else at one point to, uh, to switch to uh, TensorFlow. And uh, also when we were doing this exercise, we realized that the uh, G uh, GRU training on CPU, on uh, GPU was very slow on TensorFlow 1. And recently in August, we figured we tried TensorFlow 2.0 and it's 10 times faster. Okay, so probably the lesson is that things evolve very quickly in this environment and uh, it's good to check your assumptions all the time. Okay, so I gave a brief overview of what we've done in terms of the pipeline. Let's, let's review the, um, the, the full picture. So we started from data and model that comes from research, and we applied uh, Spark and ecosystem tools to, uh, to build the pipeline. So the steps are feature engineering at scale, codes in Jupyter Notebook running Spark, and by Spark in particular, then hyperparameter hyper optimization, again, Spark with Keras. 
and then uh, distribute a model training, Spark with Big DL and Analytics Zoo, and also we use TensorFlow. And the output uh, is a particle model, which trained uh, very well, so there was, uh, say, good performance in, of the model, and uh, smooth, uh, say, convergence of the training. In terms of future work, just to give you an idea, so the, the idea is that once you have this model, you will put it uh, in the online chain of the uh, detectors uh, that collect particles. Typically, it would be maybe in hardware, and FPGAs. But something we are thinking to explore is maybe to use a streaming, uh, as in a, uh, Kafka plus uh, Spark structure streaming, to try to see if this uh, would make sense to um, to improve the pipeline for online. There is a big challenge there, that is the data rate that comes out. Okay, in uh, final summary, the use case developed, we developed is to uh, address the, uh, the needs for higher efficiency for uh, filtering data in uh, LHC experiments. Python notebooks and Spark provide uh, very good APIs and a productive environment because one of the goals of this work also was to show to the high energy physics community that tools that come from open source like Spark, et cetera, can be used uh, for this type of uh, work. And I think this was successful. And in terms of data preparation and performance, the lessons learned uh, probably is something that uh, was expected is that Spark SQL and DataFrame API are faster and Python and UDF are very powerful, but uh, you have to pay a performance penalty at the moment, typically. And in terms of uh, scaling deep learning with Spark, Analytics Zoo and Big DL did the job on uh, CPU clusters, both on Hadoop and Cloud. And we also got very good results using TensorFlow 2.0 scaling out on Kubernetes. And then we see that there is a continuous evolution and uh, an improvement in uh, deep learning at scale. So we are always on the lookout to see what, what is happening in this community and how to get better results. And I would say going forward, I mean, both APIs and tools for data preparations that are scalable and also scalable training will be the key to, uh, to win in this, in this area. I would like to acknowledge and thank all the collaborators, also the uh, people at Intel on the Analytics Zoo and Big DL project that helped us uh, with the code. And a couple of references here, in particular reference to code and data. So feel free to, to browse it, also if you want to use this as an exercise. Um, I mentioned a little bit on the performance. We understand that the performance of both data preparation and training can be improved, so I'm sure that if you, uh, so if you play on this, you'll be able to get even better performance than what I mentioned during the talk. With this, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Uh, we have five minutes for questions if people want to. Yep. Hi, Luca. Thanks for the presentation. I really <clears throat> enjoyed it because I'm coming in the last three years in a similar scenario. We reached uh, more or less the same conclusion using different frameworks, but anyway, that's, uh, <laughs> that's the key. Uh, I'm curious about uh, the big DL framework. Uh, is it easy to uh, manage memory uh, with this framework? Because I'm assuming that big DL, uh, most part of the underlying implementation is in C++ or CUDA, depending if you use CPUs or GPUs. And uh, so you have a lot of objects in the half heap memory. Is the, this uh, an easy task to uh, manage memory for uh, during the training? or is something where you have to spend effort programmatically? Let's say from a user perspective, so what we saw, we, we just needed to have enough executors with enough memory, mm -hmm. and then Big DL will take uh, memory from, uh, from Spark. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that uh, as long as you have enough memory to basically, uh, it will cache in the, uh, using the uh, yeah. Spark caching systems. With the block manager will cache the, the, your uh, data sets, both the training and test. If you have enough memory for that, it will just run smooth. If you don't have it, yeah, you are in a problem. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Luca. It was very instructive. Uh, I would have two questions related to the uh, neural network architecture. Uh, first one, if I understood well, you label the data with simulations? Uh, yes. 
Okay. Data is produced by simulation, so also the labels come from them. So uh, that leads to the second question. Uh, aren't you uh, limited by the accuracy of those simulations? How do you validate those simulations? Okay, so the, um, the simulation business, indeed, it's here. Uh, so, uh, yeah, this was dealt more by the um, your, uh, authors of the original paper. So the, um, the tools used are standard tools in high energy physics. So basically, these are used all the time for all sorts of uh, simulations. Also for data analysis, people will take simulated data and compare it to real data. So these, uh, these tools, like Delphi's, et cetera, are the ones that are used in high energy physics all the time. So that's a, there's a lot of research that goes decades down the road, yeah. Uh, artist Danny talk. I have uh, two questions. Why is the, so at this point, you, as in your talk mentioned, it's a CPU bond? Yes. And I wonder, so I guess that might be the reason you start looking into the TensorFlow 2. And so, so will it be better if you have a GPU? I think most of the people are training the deep learning model by GPU, right? Yeah, so indeed, the um, CPU versus GPU, it's yeah, also the question, indeed, how the GPU compares. This, the, the GPU test we've done recently. So it, uh, originally, we only done CPU uh, for the reason that basically we wanted to run this on top of our analytics platform that has uh, beginning only Hadoop, and these days also uh, mm -hmm. Kubernetes. And, and there, at the moment, we don't have GPUs. Maybe they will come in the future. Mm -hmm. So indeed, it's something we don't have uh, much at the moment is uh, GPU clusters. There are GPU desktops, indeed. The, uh, the big surprise was at one point that when we used the, uh, the GPU desktop with the very latest version of TensorFlow, indeed, it performed uh, relatively well. Mm -hmm. Another thing is about data. Uh, there will be so much data you can put on, on a desktop, for example, or a machine uh, with one GPU. And uh, okay, 300 gigabytes is still uh, still uh, possible, but at the end, suppose you have more data, you would have to go anyway in distributed training. Indeed, uh, so the the usage of uh, say big data analytics zoo on CPU or TensorFlow on Kubernetes with CPU, it's uh, reasonable indeed if you don't have GPUs mm -hmm. and okay, you just put more CPU and then you do the the training. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, indeed, a GPU can be. Um, can be a solution, especially for certain models, they are known to be, to be faster. And uh, also distributed training on GPU can be quite interesting. Mm -hmm. I understand that Spark at one point will also have the possibility to, to integrate that better. So it could be. But it's also good to know that you can do this training uh, on CPU mm -hmm. at the end. So you don't, if you have a, like an Hadoop platform, uh, that works. Yeah, so the the, for the Spark 3.0, has the GPU support been introduced? And I just wonder, in that scenarios, assuming you have the Spark API enable you to do both the ETL job and the deep learning job in a smoothly fashion, yeah. in that scenario, will you still using the uh, big deal or will you using TensorFlow? Well, the, the idea indeed is, as I put it, in terms of, say, a comment here at the uh -huh. end of the summer is that uh, there is a continuous evolution on all the tools. Spark evolves, TensorFlow evolves, BigDL yeah. evolves, everything. So what we want to have, it's a smooth pipeline, ideally a pipeline that doesn't really break into, uh, say, different tools that you have to go out and come back in. And where you can do data preparation nicely, so with APIs that are easy to use, and there, of course, Spark is a big winner. And also you can do distributed training well, as fast as possible because indeed, typically data scientists want to iterate many times on the model so the faster it goes, the better. Thank you. All right, thanks. Thank you, everybody. Um, our time is up and uh, have a good lunch. <laughs>